hi guys welcome back to my channel i'm juliana today i have a um, kind of different thing to show you a different video well it's not revolutionary it's a vlog it's a reading vlog but i decided to conjunction this vlog and read two books they are related and you already know which they are because I have shown in my socials but as it only happened to me this didn't went as I thought it would so I had some um, intervals during the reading vlog to show you some recipes what I'm cooking and so on and so forth you know to be a bit more dynamic but um, <laughs> I tried to do my check-ins during those sad days that I was reading the books but every time I would film the check-ins I will be out of frame so what happens is that I had to film everything again so you will see me with the same clothes and the same makeup and this one because I'm filming today <laughs> and I I just was to, to let you know but you know doesn't give away anything about the vlog is just is not actually in real time because I'm not a very good vlogger as I found out so just to let you know, but I hope you enjoy it. The books that I'm going to show you the books. So here they are. So the first one, Madame Curie by Eve Curie. So about Marie Curie, a, bi a biography of done by her her youngest daughter Eve. And the other one is Half Lives. The Unlikely History of Radium. This is non-fiction and this is by Lucy Jane Santos. So now let's begin the vlog. Wednesday, one of my absolute favourites. It's Blue's Eye by Toni Morrison. Now this is a book that is incredibly hard to read. It deals with some really, really difficult subject matter and will not be for everyone. However, what I think this book is so
So, hello, first check-in. I'm going to start with Madame Curie by Ed Curie. I thought that um, it was more, as I've read the books already, um, I was picking my brain to how to divide the check-ins, but then I first thought to do both, like uh, in the first check-in, do the first part of a Madame Curie and then a first part of Half-Lives and moving forward doing like that, dividing the check-ins with the two books. But then I realized that as of course it would happen, the information that we have in one and the other overlap and I don't want to, I'm going to try not to repeat myself. I thought that for the thing to make more sense it would be more easy for me to start with Madame Curie. So there you go. So this book is divided in three parts and we have some photographs uh, in this book. Not many. I thought it was a shame for not to have more photographs. I don't know if they had available even, so maybe it was that. But for you to see, we have here Marie Curie in 1912 in her laboratory this was a year after she has received her second Nobel Prize in chemistry but as I was saying this is divided in three parts so we have the first part is more towards her childhood and adolescence and then the second part is when she moves to Paris and marries Pierre Curie and then the second the third part is when she well has to do the job alone and also her last works before her death. In the introduction, Eve Curie tries to present this work as, as you know, she is not an impartial biographer. She is her daughter. But she here in the introduction says that she tried to not add any flourishing to her biography. She tried to be the more concise and truthful to what really happened. And she, of course, had the help of her aunts and her sister and other uh, family members and colleagues, professional colleagues of her mother and friends of the family to try to gather information since her childhood till her own memories of Eve herself, of course, uh, of her mother. I have to say that I don't think she embellished the biography, so I quite enjoyed it. Maybe this is a spoiler, but who cares? Okay, so the first part. So we have here another photograph. Here is Marie Curie and here is, uh, so, here is Mania Sklodowska. <laughs> so here is Mania Sklodowska, known later as Marie Curie. And here is Bronia Sklodowska, her older sister. They were very close and you will understand the link 
that brought them so much together. In this first part, I'm going to um, an acknowledge Marie Curie Asmania, so her, her Polish name. And later, I will change to Marie as she herself wanted to be treated. So Mania, or Maria Skłodowska, was the youngest of five and she was born in a family where her parents were teachers. Her father was a physicist. She was born, born in Warsaw, Poland in 1867. But at this time, Poland had lost its independence and was divided between three countries, Russia, Prussia and Austria. Although education was made available to children of both sexes uh, regarding primary and secondary level, levels, the admission of women to higher edu education was prohibited. In this first part, we begin to realize that Mania, from a young age, displayed an unusual intelligence, which somewhat worried her parents. Something curious was that whenever Ma uh, Mania, or Mania uh, read a book or picked up a book or anything like that, her parents encouraged her to play with her brothers and sisters and to go outside to get some air and not to <laughs> be around books all the time. They thought she was precocious. Mania attended school for girls and immediately became the best in her class, knowing how to speak several languages and knowledgeable about history. The school for, w w where Mania was uh, having her education was just for girls, as I said, but the teachers weren't allowed to teach in Polish or learn or teach Polish to the children or teach anything related to or Poland history but of course they will do that and an incident occurs in which the inspector of Warsaw private schools appears unexpectedly. The girls hearing the doorbell run to hide the books in Polish and get the clots, needles and timbles. This inspector asks to call one of the girls of the 25 students that were present and of course the teacher calls Mania and the inspector asks a series of questions to which Mania had to answer in Russian. Pray the Lord's Prayer in Russian and list the figures of the empire among other things. And after the, ins the inspector was very pleased with Mania's uh, responses because she knew everything and the, her Russian was really good. Uh, and he went away. And when she went, uh, he went away, she almost fainted, fainted. That was an incident that translates the sentiments of Polish people in those times. Due to economic difficulties, the parents have to accept tenants as a result. And through contagion, Bronia and Sozia, they, they were sisters of Mania, fall ill. The mother is also very ill at the time. She had tuberculosis. Sozia, unfortunately, dies. And later, a few, I don't know if, you, if it was a year or two years later, the mother of Mania ends up dying as well. Mania reaches 14 years old and starts secondary school and finishes it on June 12, 1883. And after that, she takes a sabbatical year in the countryside with some relatives. When she returns, her father had found another house, now without tenants, 
but this salary will not be enough to cover all their expenses, so he gives private lessons. The oldest brother, Joseph, wanted to be a doctor, Hella wanted to be a teacher, and Bronya wants to study medicine. She wants to go to medical school, but in Poland it wouldn't be possible. So Mania and Bronia make a pact, and that is here where the link between these particular sisters is so close. Mania will become a perceiver and with her father's help they will give Bronia an allowance for the costs of an education in Paris. After Bronia graduates, it will be Mania's turn and Bronia will return the favor. So Mania applies a, as a perceiver and was accepter, accepted as a tutor in a provincial house. And it is for one of the eldest children of this couple that Mania almost ties the knot, but due to the social stature of Mania that was lower than this boy, the boy kind of <laughs> chickens out because her his parents weren't favorable to the marriage which looking at thing looking looking it with other eyes in it happened to be maybe for the best because if it if mania would have married at that time perhaps her destiny would be very different. In 1889, she finishes her services in that house in the province and soon moves to another situation in Warsaw. But in March 1890, Bronia proposed to Mania that she goes to study in France because it was finally her turn. But by that time, Mania is discouraged and hesitates, and Bronia has to insist. She will still spend a year in Warsaw with her father, after which she will take the train to Paris. So, this is kind of part one, and in the second part, we have another photograph of Marie and Pierre and Pierre Cory working together in 1896. So here it is. So in the second part, now Mania arrives to Paris and she applies to Sorbonne, the University of Paris that was so well known and so renowned in all over the world and Mania fills her fills her documents and puts the name as Marie you know in a French <laughs> she becomes she wants to be more contextualized should we say I don't know how well to say it and in the meantime Marie lives with Bronia and her fiancé, Casimir Zdolsky. Very shy, Marie does not socialize with her French colleagues. She takes refuge among her compatriots. But with the constant parties and get-togethers at Bronia and Dolsky, Dolsky's house, Marie doesn't have the privacy or time to dedicate herself 100% to her studies. So it was decided that she would move close to the university. But soon a problem arises, the lack of money. And that's when she starts to eat poorly. And in the Polish colony, it is said that Marie doesn't even know how to make soup because she was so dedicated to her studies that she neglected her nourishment. But Marie doesn't care. She eats poorly, sleeps little, 
uh, as she realized that the study base that she brought from Poland left her far behind in, uh, in her understanding of the subjects taught at the Sorbonne. And in 1893, she uh, achieves first place in physical sciences, even though, you know. And in 1894, the second degree in mathematical sciences. Through a um, friendly Polish couple that she knew when she was a preceptor in the province of Poland during those six years that she was a tutor. She knew Kowalski, he was a physicist as well, a scientist, and he went to Paris in a honeymoon and in a business trip and he calls for her and Marie ends up saying that she's working on something but she doesn't have a laboratory or a space where she can work so she doesn't know what to do and Kowalski says that he has an idea that he knows a um, Frenchman, also a scientist, also a physicist, that perhaps could help her. And who that man was? Pierre Curie. So that's when Eve, the author of the book, gives a presentation and a contextualization of the life of Pierre Curie. He was a scientist ignored in France, but already highly regarded abroad. The youngest son of two, so he had a, bro a brother called Jacques. His father was a doctor and his grandfather was also a doctor. So they have history as educated people. And Pierre and his brother gradu graduated in, phys in physics and make a stunning discovery, piezoelectricity, which leads to the invention of a new device, piezoelectric quark. And this was intended to accurate, accurate, accurately <laughs> measure small amounts of electricity. So, but returning to the story of Marie and Pierre, uh, they connected, F F describes, Eve is the author, describes what Pierre did by approaching Marie, obtaining permission to visit her, and months and months passed and a friendship developed. When the year, the college year ends, there's the question of whether Marie will be able to return to France after the holidays. And the correspondence between Pierre and Marie is clear in how Pierre was already attached to her and insisted that she returned. There is a marriage proposal, but Marie would wait a year until she accepted. Because she was so focused on her career that she had put aside the idea of a marriage. And also because she already had the experience of an almost love story with a man and that went wrong. And this is when they began the, their work together. But Marie falls pregnant with Irene uh, and in 1897 she gets to a stage where she wants to take her doctorate. To do this, she reviews the most recent physics works. She stops in front of the works of Henri Becquerel after the discovery of X-rays by Rockton, Henri Poincaré had the idea of checking whether similar rays will be emitted by fluorescent bodies subjected to the action of light. But Becquerel did the same thing with salts of rare metal, uranium. And he observed that uranium emits spontaneously 
without the action of light, rays of an unknown nature. Bacquerel had discovered the phenomenon that Marie Curie would later call radioactivity. And Marie, taking the findings of Bacquerel, starts her experiments. And she discovers that uranium was not the only element in which the phenomenon occurred. Instead of limiting herself to simple bodies, salts or oxides, she came up with the idea of putting the entire display of ores from the phys physics school through that test, to that experiment. Marie, based on her experiments, realized that this radioactivity was much stronger than predicted based on the amount of uranium and thorium contained in the substance, substances examined. She raised the hypothesis that there is a substance in small quantities that is more strongly radioactive than uranium and thorium, but she needed to isolate it, the substance. This is where Marie and Pierre work merges, but they discover that it was not one substance, but two. And in July of 1898, they announced polonium as a discovery. And in December of that same year, they announced the second element, radium. But she needed to measure its atomic weight to prove its existence. And she achieves it in 1902. The problem was, and something that I didn't mention throughout this narration, <laughs> was that during this whole process, they didn't have a laboratory with the perfect conditions for the experiments. They basically stayed in a shed. And the family budget wasn't doing well either. Pierre Curie, although a genius, never liked being awarded prizes or acknowledgements and was averse to asking for support. But the money is lacking, so he, shirrupped by colleagues, applies for Professor of Sorbonne. But many social and favorite games are in the works and his candidacy is rejected. Pierre and Marie even have a proposal from Geneva but the logistics of taking all their material to Geneva deters them. So Marie accepts a teaching position for girls at the Sèvres school. Pierre would only hold a position at the Sorbonne in 1904. And something that happens between uh, these events is in 1902, Marie's father dies. So he wasn't alive to see her, her daughter receive the Nobel Prizes, but he was there to see her findings and her achievements. So the prequel to her acknowledgement. Radium begins to be used in medicine, which would come to be known as Curie therapy. Marie, together with Pierre and other collaborators and industrialists, will create the first gram of radium. Pierre suggests to Marie that they could patent the discovery of radium, which would cost them a lot of money, which would give them a lot of money, and they would be able to build the laboratory they always wanted. But by mutual agreement, they reject this idea, saying that radium belongs to the world. In 1903, they won the Nobel Prize for Physics. Ha partly, they divided the prize. So the, the prize was divided between Henri Becquerel and the other part for Pierre and Marie. Uh, for the discoveries about radioactivity, but the Curies weren't able to be present at the ceremony. Only after receiving the Nobel Prize 
Did France value these two scientists and gave Pierre a share in physics? 1904 arrived and the new pregnancy arrived as well. This time was Eve and was only on one on February 1st, 1905, that Marie returned to her classes at Sèvres. But that same year, in June, they made the long-awaited trip to Sweden and Pierre spoke before the Stockholm Academy of Sciences. In his speech, he, praises the, he praised the discovery of radium, but warned that like any other discovery, in the wrong hands, it could be used for evil. Another milestone is Pierre's entry into the Paris Academy of Sciences, Paris or Paris, uh, achieving it by a thread in 1906. With a position at the Sorbonne, Pierre thought that he would have a laboratory, but apparently that wasn't on the list. As they didn't have space for him at the university, they found him in a street in the Couvier Street, giving them, giving them a credit of 12,000 francs. But of course, that money wasn't only for the materials of the laboratory. They had to divide it into constructing the rooms and the materials of the laboratory, so, you know. But on April 19, 1906, a tragedy struck. Pierre was ran over by a horse carriage and Marie sees herself in a hard position because he was her companion in everything, in every single part of her life. Uh, but then, of course, by his death, it came the problem of which will be the destiny of the research that they were doing at Suborn and what will be the future of Marie. And there is a back and forth between uh, the family of Marie and the Suborn University of what to do now. With the influence of George Goy, a close friend of Pierre Curie, they resolved to persuade the faculty or the university to name her as primary scientist and head of the laboratory and, you know, simply to ignore tradition and make her a professor of Sorbonne, you know, because she was a woman. I'm not going into that because the history is known, so that's a given. So on 13 of May of 1906, the Council of the Faculty of Sciences decides unanimously maintaining the chair of Pierre Curie and, and the name his widow to occupy his seat. And for the first time in higher education in France, a chair would be occupied by a woman. So now I'm going to make a pause in the check-in and uh, I will, I think I, now I will show you a lunch that I did one of those days and I will see you later. So I'm going to show you a quick lunch that I usually do. It's somewhat sorry, it's somewhat healthy. Uh, well, it's healthy. <laughs> uh, and it's pasta with tuna and mushrooms. So I use tomato paste, spaghetti, two cans of tuna and one can of mushrooms, garlic, a bit of cream cheese, I don't know if it's called cream but it's, it's kind of, 
and chili. So now I'm going, I'm going to zoom in in the pan so you can watch what I do.
back to Madame Curie. The third and final part is the life of Marie Curie after the death of Pierre Curie. And here we have a photograph of her with Irene, her, daughter, her first daughter, her oldest daughter. So this was during the First World War in 1915. So in 1908, she continued to teach at Sèvres and at the Sorbonne, where she was appointed lead professor, leading the first and only radioactivity course in the world. In 1910, she published the Treatise of Radioactivity. Then Marie tries to determine the atomic weight of radium again, and then she tackles the problem of isolating the metal from the radium. Until then, she had only been able to obtain radium salts like chloride or bromide, which were the only stable form of the stu substance. But Marie, together with a collaborator, Debierne, manages to isolate the metal. She was rejected for the Academy of Sciences of Paris, but in 1911 she received the Nobel Prize for Chemistry. And Eve makes a note in here that I thought pertinent, but I think that's a generalized thing that happens everywhere, even nowadays, that she says that her mother have always been seen as a foreigner in France. And I'm not saying that wasn't true. Of course it was. She wasn't a real... She wasn't French but, or born in France, but she lived there for many years and she worked there for many years. But whenever Marie was awarded her prize abroad, she was called the ambassador of France. So they, inside, they didn't celebrate her, but when she would be celebrated outside of France, she would be, oh, she's one of our own, you know? But, well. In 1911, a Society of Sciences elected Marie as an honorary member in Poland and months later the project emerged to create a radioactivity laboratory in Warsaw and offered Marie the direction. In May 1912 a delegation of Polish teachers or professors sought her out, but Marie, although not valued in France, does not want to leave her work in, of per, in Paris and is ready to guide the laboratory from, far, from afar. And in 1913, the, ina the inauguration took place. So, but then comes the war and Marie realized that the hospitals were practi practi practically devoid of X-ray facilities. Marie joined forces with resources from the Union of French Women for the first radiological vehicle and she never leaves Paris and she thinks about because she thinks about her laboratory. The soldiers would give the vehicles of X-rays the name of Little Curies. Of the 20 vehicles she organized she kept one for herself, a Renault similar to a delivery truck. Riding in this vehicle marked with a red cross, Marie leads a nomadic life. In addition to the 20 vehicles, 200 fixed, fixed X-ray stations were set up in ambulances and hospitals. The number of injured people examined at all these stations exceeded 1 million. And Irene, at, the, at that time with 17 years old, was trained as, nurse, as a nurse and supports her mother. 
Although they are radiological stations, there are few qualified technicians, so Marie proposes a teaching center to the government, which she has the help of another scientist, Irene, and herself as teachers of these people. After the war, they take a vacation, and Eve talks a bit about that. And in 1920, Marie is visited by an American journalist, Mrs. William Brown Melanie, director of a large magazine in New York. This journalist was wanted, has wanted an interview with Madame Corrie for years. And in her interview, she asks Marie, what thing in the world do you most want to possess? To which Marie, Marie replies a gram of radium, because at that time radium was really, really expensive. So Melanie turns to the women of America to raise funds to get Marie a gram of radium, and she succeeded. Oh, succeeds. <laughs> she makes her a condition that Marie comes to America to get the radium gram. And so then Eve will tell the voyage that them, Irene and Eve and her mother took to America. With the independence of Poland, Marie wants a big project to create a radium institute in Warsaw, a cancer research and treatment center and she asks Vronia to help her. And on May 29, 1932, it was inaugurated. After that, Eve also describes the vacation they spent with their mother and other professors and scientists from the Sorbonne in England. And she talks about her mother work, her mother's work in laboratory in Paris, her desire to finish her book on radioactivity, and so the day comes. On July 6, 1934, without speeches, without procession, without a politician, without an official personage, Madame Curie is buried in Sux next to Pierre Curie. Now that we talked about Madame Curie, let's talk about Half-Lives. So, I wanted to read to you a poem that introduces this book that I thought was very clever and in hindsight sums up the history of radium. Radium. Have you heard of radium? Latest, greatest thing on earth. More than coal the stuff is worth. An ounce brings a corking sum. And the things that it, did, it can do easily would fill the book. Anything but boss to cook if the tales we hear are true. With disease it has fun, cures consumption while you wait, and in manner up to date, slaughters microbes by the ton. Wrinkles, patches, freckles, ten. Cannot in the house remain if you have a single grain of this newest friend of men. Burglars, it will hold at bay. Strange dogs frighten from the yard. Always keep the butter hard. Cocks to way hard hands to lay. Neatly cut the children's hair, wash the windows, scrub the floor, run on errands to the store, daily score the silverware. Firmly but with green intent, fire agents through the gate, keep the family record straight, hustle round and pay the rent. Thirty million not a sow, less for one gain, COD, but it's worth it, you can see, if the tales we hear are true. 
This is by Duncan, Duncan M. Smith from 1904. In the introduction, Lucy explains how radioactivity is everywhere. In objects, in the food we eat, in our pets. But we don't think about it unless it's spoken about and then it becomes a problem. This is in good fun, of course, that, as she explains, the dosage that is present all around us is really small. And she says that, of course, we are all radiophobes now, but there was a time where radioactivity was revered, not feared. She succinctly mentions the discovery of uranium and the ultraviolet rays and infrared and she goes to the x-rays. In 1895, Ronton discovered a previ previously unknown form of powerful radiation that was invisible to the human life. It became a sensation, but Ronton never tried to patent the finding. One that profited of this was Edison, that improved on Rogenton machine and took it to the public. People queued up to put parts of their body into the direct path of the rays. It even had a name, Rogenton mania. Another scientist, Vaccarell, had begun to investigate the already observed phosphorescent properties of uranium to determine whether this phenomenon might be related to the same invisible rays the Rogenton had already discovered. He discovered, Bacquerel, that external light was not needed for the invisible rays to emerge. They came from the Iranian itself, and it became known as Bacquerel rays. So this is the overlap with what I already explained in Madame Curie, but just for you to have context, I will repeat some things. And it was about them that Marie Sklodowska Curie decided to make the focus of her doctoral research. One innovation that Marie Curie used was the, the use of the instru instrument electroscope, which detected electrical effects in the air. This was invented by Pierre Curie and Jacques Curie, his brother. What she found was that these currents were particular to only two of the mineral, mineral substances she had tested, uranium and thorium. But she discovered that between the minerals that contained these elements, they emitted a much higher electrical energy that could be anticipated and she began to suspect that, apart from uranium and thorium, it contained other and yet unknown radioactive element. In 1897, Rutherford tested the radioactive properties of uranium, and he found two rays, alpha, that could be stopped by a sheet of paper, and beta, more penetrating several layers of human skin, but can be stopped by aluminium. But Paul Villard identified, identified another ray, gamma, that was highly penetrating. In 1899, Marie Curie discovered that the radio, radioactive minerals released a gas and that led to other scientists to study, to study the matter. It later came to be part of a discovery of the transmutation of radioactive elements. So now I'm going to try to explain to you what is half-lives, the term. So, as one simplified example of a series, uranium change, changes into thorium, which in turn becomes radium. After radium comes radon, the only link in the chain that is a gas, that then decays into polonium. Eventually, after multiple transformations, 
the Uranian decay chain ends with a stable element, lead, which stays put and emits no more radiation. Each of these parts of the chain has a, dis has a distinct and varied half-life, that is the average amount of time it takes for half of the atoms of the original element to turn into a new element. So <laughs> this is very interesting but very hard to come around if you're not from, from the field. But I think it's percep perceptible. X-rays and radium quickly became of use for medical purposes. Curie therapy or radium therapy. In 1904, a few years later, with the spread use of these findings, some of it of people that experiment with X-rays and radium start to sound alarming. The dangers of overexposure to radioactivity were starkly highlighted by the death of 39-year-old Clarence Daly, an early experimenter with radium and X-rays in his role as the assistance, assistant of Thomas Edison. By the time of his death in October 1904, Daly had had his right arm amputated at the shoulder and his left and his left at the elbow. When Daly's death was reported, it was made clear what was to blame, with headlines worldwide now claiming that radioactive rays could also be a cause of cancer. But this didn't deter almost anyone from continue using radium. And after Rectan mania arrived the radiomania. So even radium came across to fashion. The fashion industry soon began to use radium to sell its products too. A brand new type of silk was launched on the marketplace in 1904. As with radium fireworks, there was not, no suggestion that this radium silk contained any form of radioactivity substance and was instead named for the sheen of the fabric, an effect which was said to shimmer in the light, bringing to mind phosphorescence. It remained a popular textile for many years and can still be purchased today. This is a quote that I found funny. Owning some radium was, thanks to its rarity and popularity, a form of cultural capital. It marked you out as a person with good connections and wealth and someone who was up to date. Much of the radium that was released onto the commercial market, whether in form of fireworks or glow-in-the-dark paint, was not in fact radioactive at all. The prestige, the very desirability of the word radium was a thrilling commodity all by itself. With no surviving costumes and little in the way of documentation, it is impossible to say whether this radium paint was genuine or not. So, a lot of quackery emerged, and quackery was a term used by journalists and some scientists at the time that are mentioned in this book. It's not my term. And because a lot of industrials and businessmen and businesswomen would state that their products would contain radium, when in actuality they perhaps they didn't. But for the majority of them, um, in actual days, we don't really know because we don't have the, um, the products in itself to do research. But everyone wanted a piece of radium. So, to change things up a bit, let's make pastéis de nata, shall we? 
the recipe that I'm following, I uh, it was in an Instagram account, a Portuguese Instagram account, so I will try to link the measures down in the box description. But you here can see that I'm using yellow sugar, that I'm putting a tablespoon of wheat flour, as you well, uh, a bit, yep. <laughs> Just a bit. Then I'm using cornstarch also. I, I'm using here one tablespoon more or less as well, but you will see later that I have to put it more. I have to ha add it more because the mixture wasn't, wasn't thickening enough. But you will see that later. But now you can see that I have a pan when I, when, where I'm putting all the ingredients. Here I'm putting cinnamon. You can put whatever you want, it's a matter of taste. So I'm putting quite a bit. As you can see now I'm trying to figure out <laughs> here I'm using lime uh, and I'm scrapping it but you can use lemon or whatever you like and I'm using the whole lime because you know it gives a very a f a very good flavor I'm mixing now I'm going to add the milk I use powder milk perhaps in my other vlog you have already seen it it's the same thing Uso you can use whatever milk you are accustomed to it can be almond milk or whatever whatever you like so i'm mixing it well and then i'm adding it in the pan this is porto wine of course <laughs> you can add whatever beverage you are accustomed to or your prefer you know so it's up to you here i'm uh, separating the egg yolk from the egg white in this recipe we only use egg yolk and we are going to use four egg yolks Now I'm preparing the puff pastry. You know, it's a, it is a hazard to do from scratch. So I just bought them already done. And here I'm going to open them, as you can see. And then I'm going to roll them, as you can see. And then I'm cutting them in little pieces. So then I can uh, palm them into the holes of the trays. Now I'm just putting a bit of butter and in the um, holes of the tray. And then I'm going to add a bit of wheat flour so that the pastry doesn't glue on the tray. And well, here is the process of 
while palming the pieces of puff pastry to fit in the holes in the tray. Here I'm, it's only appearing one tray but they are two with six holes each and I tried different methods but I thought the best ones were, were to palm them with my hands first in a circle and then fit them in the holes as you can see that I'm trying to do of course it doesn't stay perfect but that's not the point this is homemade so <laughs> that's going to look like that this isn't a pastry shop or anything so here I put the pan with the mixture in the stove in low light or slow light or I don't know how well to call it and you have to mix it very well as you can see mix it a lot here I am having more uh, cornstarch as you can see because the mixture wasn't thickening so I had to add more so this is this is more was more like an experiment and now I'm going to add the egg yolks they are four as you can see and again you will have to mix everything very well and you have to mix all the time you have in the stove because it can be glued to the pan and you don't want it so now the mixture is ready and I'm going to um, put bit by bit in the puff pastries so here I'm spreading it more or like evil, evilly uh, it's not going to be the same for all of them but <laughs> the amount I mean but you know it's more or less the same thing and I'm going to do them for all of them now I'm going to put them the trays in the oven at a 180 to 200 degrees celsius for i would say 20 minutes i think that was the time that it took but you have to take an eye on it every single time and now i'm going to take them out i'm waiting for the vapor to come out of the oven and let's see how how they are and here they are they are not in frame as always but i'm going to show you here it is a close-up to the pastéis de nata well of course they don't look like the pastéis de nata done in a pastry shop, of course not, but I think they look very nice and they were very tasty. This was a recipe that I did during Christmas, so I thought to add here. So hello again, let's take to the final part of the check-in. Uh, we will continue talking about half-lives. I will talk about the last two portions of the book. I never said to you, but so this book has uh, six chapters with one introduction and an epilogue. But I divided this more or less in three parts so I could talk to you and now we are going to talk about chapter 3 to 5 and then chapter 6 and the epilogue so um, 
With the dissemination of the idea of mild radium therapy, the knowing of the water cures was for a long time known as looped for the cure of ailments, thinking about, for example, Bath in England. It was founded, founded the first Raven Spa. In 1864, mine workers in Joen Gemstall accidentally broke into a spring of flooded the lower levels of the mine. Because of the high predicted cost of drainage, a decision was made to close the area and for miners to continue their work in another part of the mountain. No one gave a second thought to the flooded area areas until, in 1903, it was discovered that Raven could be present in water and the realization that as the mountains surrounding the town were rich in uranium, the water in the, min in the mine must also be radioactive. In 1906, the principal physician at St. Joam Gistel, Dr. Leopold Gottlieb, was inspired by a visit from Edmund von Nassur a physician from Berlin who spearhe spearheaded the development of mild radiant therapy to set, to set up the world's first purpose-built radiant spa, the, called the Experimental Spa Institute. So after this, and other towns around the world began to say that their waters were radioactive. You know, this was all for commercial purposes. <laughs> Something <laughs> that I thought funny was this here. Historically, in the absence of any serious scientific explanation for how water cures actually worked, it had been suggest suggested it was the spirit that gave each body of water its particular and unique health giving properties. A crucial part of this argument held that the spirit could not be captured, giving rise to a belief that the only way to secure the benefits of the waters was to take them at their source. If the water left the site, then the spirit, the healing power, will not go with it. The spirit was tied to the site as the treatment wouldn't be effective. So was this type of thinking that made water cures and spas so successful? So there is a chapter within a chapter that is called The Great American Fraud. And it says, the American Medical Association was particularly concerned about charm products, sham products, those made by companies that knowingly defraud customers through misrepresentation or adulteration. One manifestation of this was radiant treatments that contain, contained no radian at all. There was a lack of accord between medical protection practitioners on how to appropriately treat diseases like tuberculosis and cancer and boom in advertising. The US government had introduced a small amount of, legis of legislation to protect the consumer from adulterated and misbranded products. Primarily, the Pure Food and Drug Act which was signed by President Theodore Roosevelt in 1906 and became law on 1st January 1907. This act was one of the first of a series of consumer protection laws introduced in the US. It was the result of decades of campaigning by activists and medical professionals. The act included two main provisions. First, the presence and proportion of 11 different habit-forming drugs, which included alcohol, morphine, opium, cocaine, 
heroin, chloroform, cannabis, chloral hydrate, or any der derivate of any of these should be listed on the packaging. Second, no false or misleading statements should appear on the label. The act has limited, limited reach and plenty of wiggle room in its interpretation, and there was no real enforcement except for small fines. There was also no mechanism for keeping the public informed about the products under investigation. But patent medicines were not the primary focus of the act, thus it didn't specifically address the very real problem they posed and it offered no protection against other potentially dangerous or useless substances. Radium fell outside of the regulation because it was not considered habit-forming as was classified as a natural element rather than a drug. So, next in the leading up to this, that is a chapter called Radal. And the phrase that this Radal was concerning was, I can cure cancer. And this was stated supposedly by a man called Rupert Wells, MD of St. Louis, Missouri. And this was surrounding 1904. Wells made some serious claims for radal, including that it would cure cancer in all forms, locations and stages. He also said it will treat a number of other serious afflictions, including tuberculosis, malaria, blood poisoning and ulcers. And the adverts were compelling. Other than the image of Wells exuding confidence, there were bold statements such as the wonders of radium are the talk of the civilized world. But the only problem was that Wells and Radal were both fakes. It was subsequent, subsequently confirmed that Rupert Wells was neither a, an MD nor a real person. Rupert Wells was instead the alias of the real life Denis Rupert Dubois. They confirmed that the mixture was actually an acid solution of quinine sulfate, responsible for the much lauded fluorescent effect, and alcohol but no radium whatsoever. As alcohol, recognized as a poisonous substance, had not been listed on the label as an ingredient, radal was deemed to be misbranded. So this is an example of much more that uh, Lucy, Lucy Jane Santos does in here of quackery that was introduced in the market by various people trying to grab the mold, the success and the sensation of radium. With the coming of the First World War in 1914, another huge radium market had opened up, glow-in-the-dark watches and clocks. In the book Knowledge for War, Every Officer Handbook for the Front, written by Captain B.C. Lake and published around 1916, there was a list of indispensable items. First on the list, even before the field glasses and revolver is luminous wrist wristwatch with unbreakable glass. So this was another opportunity for the commerce to take the train of radium and go with it. So then he uh, talks about uh, Madame Curie and the work she did during the war and in companionship with the Red Cross uh, in transporting x-rays equipment into the field. 
so I already talked about it and he she talks about that soldiers would injured soldiers would go to health spas receiving to receive radioactive water treatments then in chapter 5 it will mention a lot of names of entrepreneurs who in the field of beauty and cosmetics were using allegedly revolutionary products containing radium and I'm not going into it so much because this will talk about people and a lot of women also that were entrepreneurs and they have their own businesses and they did creams, day creams, night creams and that they will sell in their salons. We'll talk about many people that took the train of radium as well and of course the thing is the same if they really had radium or not we never know we never could know or in some cases at least but there is a thing that i wanted to mention that is x-ray beauty practitioners like grobet have experimented with x-rays on skin disease and cancers almost as soon as Vogton discovered them. At the same time, other researchers have tested the rays to treat hypertrichosis and other forms of abnormal or excess hair growth. The possibility that x-rays will be effective in, the, in this manner has been suggested in 1896. X-ray hair removal, while bizarre to us now, offered significant benefits over the treatments available at the time. Also, there were numerous scientific studies to back up the an anecdotal results of the operators and companies that offer this particular service. Extra reinsurance was provided by the observation that the treatment had won the Grand Prix at the Paris General Commercial in 1925. It was won, it also won the Medaille d'Or in Liège 1926, thought there was no mention of the terms of winning that prize. Every firm represented there had also won as they just had to pay the equivalent of $400 for the privilege. While the practice of x-ray hair removal lasted for slightly, slightly longer in the United States, it quickly stopped in Britain by the London Council, County Council. The, LL, the LCC investigated the Trico Institute in 1927 after it reapplied for a license and con concluded that the risk of cancer developing from the use of x-rays renders their use for improving the appearance a danger to the public. The Trichel Institute in America was not without its troubles either, with several legal cases brought against it by patients. The resultant investigations were carried carried out by the American Medical Association, the Better Business Association, and on a local level by the State Departments. A report in 1930 by Dr. H. H. Hazen reported, reported on 10 cases in which people were harmed. They had suffered blotches, damaged gums, and injured skin as a result of x-ray beauty treatments. Trico collapsed in 1930 and was wound up by 1932. Then it describes, as you can see here, cases of women that uh, years after they had treatments with x-rays to remo uh, remove hairs in their faces or in their bodies, they developed cancer. But you know, this was the ignorance and, um, and the negligence at the time. 
we go back to the watches that glow in the dark and as for the war effort many women worked at factories painting these watches and then came upon to be known as radium girls because as the x-rays um, women that had treatments to hair removal the women that would work in these factories painting the watches also have cancer and other diseases and they were linked to the radium contained in the paints something that is astonishing is a phrase in here that <laughs> it was the um, the factories trying to defend themselves and they said finally it was suggested that the dio painters problems were psychological radium radium because of the mystery which surrounds much of its actions is a topic which stimulates the imagination and to our mind it is to is it is to this and not to actual fact that many of the reports of the luminous paints effects in our plant may be attributed. So they were saying that it was the imagination of these women that make her, made her sick or made them sick. Like the suffering of the radium girls led to investigators learning a great deal about the behavior of radium inside humans. It was discovered that it did not pass straight through the body as it had previ previously thought, but accumulated in various organs. Because there was no, nowhere for it to go, it continually irradiated the surrounding cells. Radium was compared to calcium, which had a simil similar chemical structure causing deposits concentrating in the bones but whereas calcium strengthens the mineral content of the skeleton radium has a rather different effect it bombards the skeleton with alpha radiation blasting holes in the bones and irradiating the blood forming bone marrow in its relentless destruction and with a half-life of around 1,600 years, it continues to assault even after death. Eventually, the U.S. Radium Corporation agreed to pay compensation for injuries of deaths for a few of its workers. Nominal sums were paid to some of the women husbands for the loss of their wives' services. Other firms fought the lawsuits brought against them or settled out, out or settled out of court. More typically, claimants dropped the cases. Perhaps it did not seem worth the fight. Then Lucy goes to talk about another product that was developed by Bailey Radium Laboratories called Raditor. And the same thing, it claimed to treat over 150 diseases, especially sexual impotence and lethargy. So, you know, this is another example of a quackery. <laughs> Maybe not a quackery. Maybe these people, it, this is something like that Lucy Jane Santos says. These people at the time, you know, genu genuinely thought that they were doing well, or good, I mean. Um, and that radium really could help people. Because they didn't know the real consequences of the usage of radium. Some would say that they had radium in their products and they really didn't and others really had radium and really promoted it thought thinking that it was doing good but in hindsight we now know that it was really dangerous 
Something that she says about this Redditor in specific, I thought it was interesting and that is, as many of these products were sold on the promise of restoring virality, there was an embarrass embarrassment factor here as well. But moving forward, something, a curiosity about Madame Curie again, um, is that uh, that is mentioned in this book, Half Lives, uh, on the contrary of Madame Curie, it says like this, surprisingly, the rhythm levels of the coffin air suggested that the radiant content of Sklodowska Curie's body was not high enough to have been the cause of her death. Instead, the facts suggested that her radiation ailments were likely the result of X-ray exposure from her war work rather than from any internal exposure due to ingestion or breathing radioactivity. Isn't that curious? <laughs> everyone, everyone and uh, even in school, I think, we hear this from professors that it was because of radium that Marie Curie died. But in this book, it says otherwise, so we don't know. So with the Second World War, it comes the atomic bomb. And Lucy Jane Santos goes and talks a bit about it and how the Manhattan Project went not so much in detail, but, you know, she talks about it. And she also talks about after the end of the Second World War and after the bomb, what happened and what some decisions that were made. And then in the epilogue, she will bring, you know, some reflections of what she has uh, narrated through her book and she will talk specifically in Bath and how many of the waters are still most definitely radioactive. <laughs> I have no idea of this. She also talks about that in Britain while certain elements must be present for water to be recognized as a natural mineral water as opposed to spring purified or well water, there is no requirement for any analysis of trace elements such as radium, radon, thorium or uranium or for such elements to be listed anywhere. I have no idea about this either. She even talks about that many of the buildings that are still in use with their occupants unaware of their prior use. The building that once housed, housed Arts Radium Company is now a branch of the French luxury brand Longchamp. The Mayfair salons of Ellen Cavendish are still in use as the shops of Chômage Joueurs and Hugo Boss. Glow in the dark radium watchers are highly collectible and come onto the market in alarming numbers and often in very poor condition. Of course, now they are not luminous, and that's not because the radium ran out. That will not happen in any of our lifetimes but because the radium destroyed the chemicals used to trigger the glow. Radium spa culture still thrives, most notably in places in Germany, the Czech Republic and Austria. Visitor numbers to Shashimov are impressive for a town that proudly, proudly labels itself the first radium spa in the world and offers a range of doctor-supervised treatments in its radium-rich waters. Here, what is referred to as the boggy name Rhythm is tackled head-on in their mar marketing materials. Most people here, most 
mostly negative information about the ionizing radiation. Yet, the ionizing radiation in the hands of the medical doctor is less risky than, for example, penicillin. People still die of an allergy reaction to penicil penicillin. Nobody has died of medical irradiation yet. She even says that um, supporters of present-day mild radiant therapy point to studies which they claim suggest that low-level low level radiation can benefit health. They also draw comparisons with other substances like aspirin that can be fatal in large amounts yet are widely regarded as helpful in small doses. So stuff like that. But I thought these two books were very interesting. Uh, they complement each other. Of course that I did <laughs> this vlog will be immense. I know it. But because I, I talk so slowly and I wanted to give so much information as much as I could. But you have to read these two books because if you are curious about the subject um, or if you are interested in Madame Curie, I think you will enjoy this one very much as well. Or either way. And, and as you can see, I marked a lot of in these two books. Um, I love them. And I think, now I'm not sure if I'm going to do this now, but maybe in the future I will look for the bibliography in this book, in Half-Lives, because she mentions a lot of sources, which I thought it was curious and interesting. It perked my curiosity, so... Perhaps I will come back to this subject, but I have to say that regarding Madame Curie, although it was written by her daughter, I thought this, it was a very impartial biography. Um, of course, I couldn't know because uh, I wasn't there to watch and live with her, but um, I didn't think that she put in a lot of comments about some stuff that, for example, um, will be discussed in Half-Lives. She mentions it, she claims that she is not there to criticize or be judgmental and she m moves on. So I think she was very elegant in that way and it was fabulous to see and hopeful to watch how a pair of people that knew each other, perhaps by chance, um, I'm talking about Marie Curie and Pierre Curie, uh, complemented each other so well. And of course, I don't know the intimacy between th them two, but I'm supposing, at least in what I read in this book, that they were really affectionate with each other and somewhat dependent on each other because there's a passage in the book that Eve talk, says that Pierre was a bit jealous even of his own daughters so he wouldn't want to <laughs> be a part of Marie for a second. He wanted to study with her or at least with her presence. You know, her presence was very important to him and he couldn't think without her in the room. Stuff like that. And I thought it was really funny. Uh, and it was really a tragedy and an immense loss um, for him to die so young and so soon uh, because we you know we come to wonder what 
would they do together if he was if he had continued to be alive and he and Marie would work together so what will they find what will they develop together <laughs> you know destiny sometimes had other plans and it was an immense tragedy uh, i i never realized that until i read this book because i always heard talking about marie curie I heard somewhat about her husband, but I never had the real image and the real perception of his genius. And in this book, Eve, the, although she never knew him uh, because she was a baby when he died, um, she really makes um, a great testimony of her father. So it was wonderful and this one was very very interesting the ways that the unknown is sometimes um, <laughs> taken advantage of in the worst ways of course we can say they were really at fault because they didn't know the consequences of the usage of radium but this is also a warning that I think it, it became and it stayed in history as a learning lesson for the scientific community and the medical community for the usage of an unknown substance so you know everything has to evolve everything has to develop and the, in the case of radium it was a great example so yeah this will be huge i'm going to have to edit this and i don't know how i'm going to do this but i hope you have enjoyed it please please try to read this one I highly advise you. I love them. Hopefully you will see me talk about it uh, about this subject in the future, who knows. But until then, I see you next time. Bye.